Chapter 13 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 5, 1860 to 1865. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jessica Marie from Novato, California. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 5, 1860 to 1865, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul, 1812 to 1888. We will pay a visit to Switzerland and wander through that country of mountains, whose steep and rocky sides are overgrown with forest trees. Let us climb to the dazzling snow fields at their summits and descend again to the green meadows beneath, through which rivers and brooks rush along as if they could not quickly enough reach the sea and vanish. Fiercely shines the sun over those deep valleys, as well as upon the heavy masses of snow which lie on the mountains. During the year, these accumulations thaw or fall into the rolling avalanche, or are piled up in shining glaciers. Two of these glaciers lie in the broad rocky cliffs between the Shrekhorn and the Wetterhorn, near the little town of Grindelwald. They're wonderful to behold, and therefore in the summer time strangers come here from all parts of the world to see them. They cross snow covered mountains and travel through the deep valleys or ascend for hours, higher and still higher, the valleys appearing to sink lower and lower as they proceed, and become as small as if seen from an air balloon. Over the lofty summits of these mountains the clouds often hang like a dark veil, while beneath in the valley, where many brown wooden houses are scattered about, the bright rays of the sun may be shining upon a little brilliant patch of green, making it appear almost transparent. The waters foam and dash along in the valleys beneath. The streams from above trickle and murmur as they fall down the rocky mountain's side, looking like glittering silver bands. On both sides of the mountain path stand these little wooden houses, and as within there are many children and many mouths to feed, each house has its own little potato garden. These children rush out in swarms and surround travelers, whether on foot or in carriages. They're all clever at making a bargain. They offer for sale the sweetest little toy houses, models of the mountain cottages in Switzerland. Whether it be rain or sunshine, these crowds of children are always to be seen with their wares. About twenty years ago, there might be seen occasionally, standing at a short distance from the other children, a little boy, who was also anxious to sell his curious wares. He had an earnest, expressive countenance, and held the box containing his carved toys tightly with both hands, as if unwilling to part with it. His earnest look, and being also a very little boy, made him noticed by the strangers, so that he often sold the most without knowing why. An hour's walk farther up the ascent lived his grandfather, who cut and carved the pretty little toy houses, and in the old man's room stood a large press, full of all sorts of carved things, nutcrackers, knives and forks, boxes with beautifully carved foliage, leaping chamois, it contained everything that could delight the eyes of a child. But the boy, who was named Rudy, looked with still greater pleasure and longing at some old firearms which hung upon the rafters under the ceiling of the room. His grandfather promised him that he should have them some day, but that he must first grow big and strong and learn how to use them. Small as he was, the goats were placed in his care, and a good goat keeper should also be a good climber, and such Rudy was. He sometimes, indeed, climbed higher than the goats, for he was fond of seeking for birds' nests at the top of high trees. He was bold and daring, but was seldom seen to smile, excepting when he stood by the roaring cataract or heard the descending roll of the avalanche. He never played with the other children, and was not seen with them, unless his grandfather sent him down to sell his curious workmanship. Rudy did not much like trade. He loved to climb the mountains, or to sit by his grandfather and listen to his tales of olden times, or of the people in Maidingen, the place of his birth. In the early ages of the world, said the old man, 
These people could not be found in Switzerland. They are a colony from the north, where their ancestors still dwell, and are called Swedes. This was something for Rudy to know, but he learnt more from other sources, particularly from the domestic animals who belonged to the house. One was a large dog called Ahola, which had belonged to his father, and the other was a tomcat. This cat stood very high in Rudy's favor, for he had taught him to climb. Come out on the roof with me, said the cat, and Rudy quite understood him, for the language of fowls, ducks, cats, and dogs is as easily understood by a young child as his own native tongue. But it must be at the age when grandfather's stick became a neighing horse with head, legs, and tail. Some children retain these ideas later than others, and they're considered backwards and childish for their age. People say so, but is it so? Come out on the roof with me, little Rudy, was the first thing he heard the cat say, and Rudy understood him. What people say about falling down is all nonsense, continued the cat. You will not fall unless you are afraid. Come, now, set one foot here and another there, and feel your way with your forefeet. Keep your eyes wide open and move softly, and if you come to a hole, jump over it and cling fast as I do. And this was just what Rudy did. He was often on the sloping roof with the cat, or on the tops of high trees, but more frequently higher still on the ridges of the rocks where pus never came. Higher, higher, cried the trees in the bushes. See to what height we have grown, and how fast we hold, even to the narrow edges of the rocks. Rudy often reached the top of the mountain before the sunrise, and there inhaled his morning draught of the fresh, invigorating mountain air, God's own gift, which men call the sweet fragrance of plant and herb on the mountainside, and the mint and wild thyme in the valleys. The overhanging clouds absorb all heaviness from the air, and the winds convey them away over the pine tree summits. The spirit of fragrance, light and fresh, remained behind, and this was Rudy's morning draught. The sunbeams, those blessing-bringing daughters of the sun, kissed his cheeks. Vertigo might be lurking on the watch, but he dared not approach him. The swallows, who had not less than seven nests in his grandfather's house, flew up to him and his goats, singing, We and you, you and we. They brought him greetings from his grandfather's house, even from two hens, the only birds of the household. But Rudy was not intimate with them. Although so young and such a little fellow, Rudy had traveled a great deal. He was born in the canton of Valais and brought to his grandfather over the mountains. He had walked to Stobich, a little town that seemed to flutter in the air like a silver veil, the glittering snow-clad mountain Jungfrau. He had also been to the great glaciers, but this is connected with a sad story, for here his mother met her death, and his grandfather used to say that all Rudy's childish merriment was lost from that time. His mother had written in a letter that before he was a year old he had laughed more than he had cried, but after his fall into the snow-covered crevice his disposition had completely changed. The grandfather seldom spoke of this, but the fact was generally known. Rudy's father had been a postillion, and the large dog which now lived in his grandfather's cottage had always followed him on his journeys over the Simplon to the Lake of Geneva. Rudy's relations on his father's side lived in the canton of Valais and in the valley of the Rhone. His uncle was a chamois hunter and a well-known guide. Rudy was only a year old when his father died, and his mother was anxious to return with her child to her own relations, who lived in the Bernice Oberland. Her father dwelt at a few hours' distance from Grindelwald. He was a carver in wood, and gained so much by it that he had plenty to live upon. She set out homewards in the month of June, carrying her infant in her arms, and, accompanied by two chamois hunters, crossed the jemmy on her way to Grindelwald. They had already left more than half the journey behind them. They had crossed high ridges and traversed snowfields. They could even see her native valley with its familiar wooden cottages. They had only one more glacier to climb. Some newly fallen snow concealed a cleft which, 
though it did not extend to the foaming waters in the depths beneath, was still much deeper than the height of a man. The young woman, with a child in her arms, slipped upon it, sank in, and disappeared. Not a shriek, not a groan was heard, nothing but the whining of a little child. More than an hour elapsed before her two companions could obtain from the nearest house ropes and poles to assist in raising them, and it was with much exertion that they at last succeeded in raising from the crevice what appeared to be two dead bodies. Every means was used to restore them to life. With the child they were successful, but not with the mother. So the old grandfather received his daughter's little son into his house, an orphan, a little boy who laughed more than he cried, but it seemed as if laughter had left him in the cold ice world into which he had fallen, where, as the Swiss peasants say, the souls of the lost are confined till the judgment day. The glaciers appear as if a rushing stream had been frozen in its course and pressed into blocks of green crystal, which, balanced one upon another, form a wondrous palace of crystal for the ice maiden, the queen of the glaciers it is she whose mighty power can crush the traveller to death and arrest the flowing river in its course she is also a child of the air and with the swiftness of the chamois she can reach the snow-covered mountain tops where the boldest mountaineer has to cut footsteps in the ice to ascend she will sail on a frail pine twig over the raging torrents beneath and spring lightly from one iceberg to another with her long snow-white hair flowing around her and her dark green robe glittering like the waters of the deep swiss lakes mine is the power to seize and crush she cried once a beautiful boy was stolen from me by man a boy whom i had kissed but had not kissed to death he is again among mankind and tends the goats on the mountains he is always climbing higher and higher far away from all others but not from me he is mine i will send for him and she gave vertigo the commission it was summer and the ice maiden was melting amidst the green verdure when vertigo swung himself up and down vertigo has many brothers quite a troop of them and the ice maiden chose the strongest among them they exercise their power in different ways and everywhere. Some sit on the banisters of steep stairs, others on the outer rails of lofty towers, or spring like squirrels along the ridges of the mountains. Others tread the air as a swimmer treads the water, and lure their victims here and there till they fall into the deep abyss. Vertigo and the Ice Maiden clutch at human beings as the polypus seizes upon all that comes within its reach and now Vertigo was to seize Rudy. "'Seize him indeed!' cried Vertigo. "'I cannot do it. That monster of a cat has taught him her tricks. That child of the human race has a power within him which keeps me at a distance. I cannot possibly reach the boy when he hangs from the branches of trees over the precipice, or I would gladly tickle his feet and send him heels overhead through the air. But I cannot accomplish it. We must accomplish it.' said the ice maiden either you or i must and i will i will no no sounded through the air like an echo on the mountain church bell's chime it was an answer in song in the melting tones of a chorus from others of nature's spirits good and loving spirits the daughters of the sunbeam they who place themselves in a circle every evening on the mountain peaks there they spread out their rose-colored wings which as the sun sinks become more flaming red until the lofty alps seem to burn with fire men call this the alpine glow after the sun has set they disappear within the white snow on the mountain tops and slumber there till sunrise when they again come forth they have great love for flowers for butterflies and for mankind and from among the latter they had chosen little rudy you shall not catch him, you shall not seize him, they sang. Greater and stronger than he have I seized, said the ice maiden. Then the daughters of the sun sang a song of the traveller, whose cloak had been carried away by the wind. The wind took the covering, but not the man. It could even seize upon him, but not hold him fast. The children of strength are more powerful, more ethereal even than we are. They can rise higher than our parent, the sun. 
They have the magic words that rule the wind and the waves and compel them to serve and obey, and they can at last cast off the heavy oppressive weight of mortality and soar upwards. Thus sweetly sounded the bell-like tones of the chorus, and each morning the sun's rays shone through the one little window of the grandfather's house upon the quiet child. The daughters of the sunbeam kissed him. They wished to thaw and melt and obliterate the ice kiss which the queenly maiden of the glaciers had given him as he lay in the lap of his dead mother, in the deep crevice of ice from which he had been so wonderfully rescued. 2. The Journey to the New Home Rudy was just eight years old when his uncle, who lived on the other side of the mountain, wished to have the boy, as he thought he might obtain a better education with him and learn something more. His grandfather thought the same, so he consented to let him go. Rudy had many to say farewell to, as well as his grandfather. First, there was Ahola, the old dog. Your father was the postillion, and I was the postillion's dog, said Ahola. We have often traveled the same journey together. I knew all the dogs and men on this side of the mountain. It is not my habit to talk much, but now that we have so little time to converse together, I will say something more than usual. I will relate to you a story which I have reflected upon for a long time. I do not understand it, and very likely you will not but that is of no consequence. I have, however, learnt from it that in this world things are not equally divided, neither for dogs nor for men. All are not born to lie on the lap and to drink milk. I have never been petted in this way, but I have seen a little dog seated in the place of a gentleman or a lady and travelling inside a post-chaise. The lady who was his mistress or of whom he was master, carried a bottle of milk, of which the little dog now and then drank. She also offered him pieces of sugar to crunch. He sniffed at them proudly, but would not eat one, so she ate them herself. I was running along the dirty road by the side of the carriage as hungry as a dog could be, chewing the cud of my own thoughts, which were rather in confusion. But many other things seemed in confusion also. Why was not I lying on a lap and traveling in a coach? I could not tell, yet I knew I could not alter my own condition, either by barking or growling. This was Ahola's farewell speech, and Rudy threw his arms round the dog's neck and kissed his cold nose. Then he took the cat in his arms, but he struggled to get free. You're getting too strong for me, he said, but I will not use my claws against you. Clamber away over the mountains. It was I who taught you to climb. Do not fancy you're going to fall, and you'll be quite safe. Then the cat jumped down and ran away. He did not wish Rudy to see that there were tears in his eyes. The hens were hopping about the floor. One of them had no tail. A traveler, who had fancied himself a sportsman, had shot off her tail. He had mistaken her for a bird of prey. Rudy's going away over the mountains, said one of the hens. He's always in such a hurry, said the other, and I don't like taking leave. So they both hopped out. But the goats said farewell. They bleated and wanted to go with him. They were so very sorry. Just at this time, two clever guides were going across the mountains to the other side of the Gemi, and Rudy was to go with them on foot. It was a long walk for such a little boy, but he had plenty of strength and invincible courage. The swallows flew with him a little way, singing, We and you, you and we. The way led across the rushing Lutschine, which falls in numerous streams from the dark clefts of the Grindelwald glaciers. Trunks of fallen trees and blocks of stone form bridges over these streams. After passing a forest of alders, they began to ascend, passing by some blocks of ice that had loosened themselves from the side of the mountain and lay across their path. They had to step over these ice blocks, or walk round them. Rudy crept here and ran there, his eyes sparkling with joy as he stepped so firmly with his iron-tipped mountain shoe that he left a mark behind him wherever he placed his foot. The earth was black where the mountain torrents or the melted ice had poured upon it, but the bluish-green glassy ice sparkled and glittered. They had to go around little pools, little lakes, 
enclosed between large masses of ice, and while thus wandering out of their path, they came near an immense stone, which lay balanced on the edge of an icy peak. The stone lost its balance just as they reached it, and rolled over into the abyss beneath, while the noise of its fall was echoed back from every hollow cliff of the glaciers. They were always going upwards. The glaciers seemed to spread above them like a continued chain of masses of ice, piled up in wild confusion between bare and rugged rocks. Rudy thought for a moment of what had been told him, that he and his mother had once lain buried in one of these cold, heart-chilling fissures. But he soon banished such thoughts and looked upon the story as fabulous, like many other stories which had been told him. Once or twice, when the men thought the way was rather difficult for such a little boy, they held out their hands to assist him, but he would not accept their assistance, for he stood on the slippery ice as firmly as if he had been a chamois. They came at length to rocky ground, sometimes stepping upon moss-covered stones, sometimes passing beneath stunted fir trees, and again through green meadows. The landscape was always changing, but ever above them, towered the lofty snow-clad mountains, whose names not only Rudy but every other child knew, the Jungfrau, the Monk, and the Eiger. Rudy had never been so far away before. He had never trodden on the wide-spreading ocean of snow that lay here with its immovable billows, from which the wind blows off the snowflake now and then, as it cuts the foam from the waves of the sea. The glaciers stand here so close together, it might almost be said they are hand in hand, and each is a crystal palace for the ice maiden, whose power and will it is to seize and imprison the unwary traveler. The sun shone warmly, and the snow sparkled as if covered with glittering diamonds. Numerous insects, especially butterflies and bees, lay dead in heaps on the snow. They had ventured too high, or the wind had carried them here and left them to die of cold. Around the Wetterhorn hung a feathery cloud, like a wool bag, and a threatening cloud too, for as it sunk lower it increased in size, and concealed within was a foon, fearful in its violence should it break loose. This journey, with its varied incidents, the wild paths, the night passed on the mountain, the steep rocky precipices, the hollow clefts in which the rustling waters from time immemorial had worn away passages for themselves through blocks of stone, all these were firmly impressed on Rudy's memory. In the forsaken stone building, which stood just beyond the seas of snow, they one night took shelter. Here they found some charcoal and pine branches, so that they soon made a fire. They arranged couches to lie on as well as they could, and then the men seated themselves by the fire, took out their pipes, and began to smoke. They also prepared a warm spice drink, of which they partook, and Rudy was not forgotten. He had his share. Then they began to talk of those mysterious beings with which the land of the Alps abounds, the hosts of apparitions which come in the night and carry off the sleepers through the air to the wonderful floating town of Venice, of the wild herdsman who drives the black sheep across the meadows. These flocks are never seen, yet the tinkle of their little bells has often been heard, as well as their unearthly bleeding. Rudy listened eagerly, but without fear, for he knew not what fear meant, and while he listened, he fancied he could hear the roaring of the spectral herd. It seemed to come nearer and roar louder, till the men heard it also and listened in silence, till at length they told Rudy that he must not dare to sleep. It was a fun, that violent storm wind which rushes from the mountain to the valley beneath, and in its fury snaps asunder the trunks of large trees as if they were but slender reeds, and carries the wooden houses from one side of a river to the other as easily as we could move the pieces on a chessboard. After an hour had passed, they told Rudy that it was all over and he might go to sleep, and fatigued with his long walk, he readily slept at the word of command. Very early the following morning they again set out. The sun on this day lighted up for Rudy new mountains, new glaciers, and new snowfields. 
they had entered the Canton Valley and found themselves on the ridge of the hills which can be seen from Grindelwald, but he was still far from his new home. They pointed out to him other clefts, other meadows, other woods and rocky paths, and other houses. Strange men made their appearance before him, and what men! They were misshapen, wretched-looking creatures, with yellow complexions, and on their necks were dark, ugly lumps of flesh, hanging down like bags. They were called Cretans. They dragged themselves along painfully and stared at the strangers with vacant eyes. The women looked more dreadful than the men. Poor Rudy! Were these the sort of people he should see at his new home? 3. The Uncle Rudy arrived at last at his uncle's house and was thankful to find the people like those he had been accustomed to see. There was only one cretin amongst them, a poor idiot boy, one of those unfortunate beings who, in their neglected conditions, go from house to house and are received and taken care of in different families for a month or two at a time. Poor Saperly had just arrived at his uncle's house when Rudy came. The uncle was an experienced hunter. He also followed the trade of a cooper. His wife was a lively little person with a face like a bird, eyes like those of an eagle, and a long, hairy throat. Everything was new to Rudy. The fashion of the dress, the manners, the employments, and even the language. But the latter his childish ear would soon learn. He saw also that there was more wealth here when compared with his former home at his grandfather's. The rooms were larger, the walls were adorned with the horns of the chamois and brightly polished guns. Over the door hung a painting of the Virgin Mary. Fresh alpine roses and a burning lamp stood near it. Rudy's uncle was, as we have said, one of the most noted chamois hunters in the whole district and also one of the best guides. Rudy soon became the pet of the house, but there was another pet, an old hound, blind and lazy, who would never more follow the hunt well as he had once done so. But his former good qualities were not forgotten, and therefore the animal was kept in the family and treated with every indulgence. Rudy stroked the old hound, but he did not like the strangers, and Rudy was as yet a stranger. He did not, however, long remain so. He soon endeared himself to every heart and became like one of the family. We are not very badly off here in the Canton Valley, said his uncle one day. We have the chamois. They do not die so fast as the wild goats, and it is certainly much better here now than in former times. How highly the old times have been spoken of, but ours is better. The bag has been opened, and a current of air now blows through our once confined valley. Something better always makes its appearance when old, worn-out things fail. When his uncle became communicative, he would relate stories of his youthful days and farther back still of the warlike times in which his father had lived. Valet was then, as he expressed it, only a closed-up bag, quite full of sick people, miserable cretins. But the French soldiers came, and they were capital doctors. They soon killed the disease and the sick people, too. The French people knew how to fight in more ways than one, and the girls knew how to conquer, too. And when he said this, the uncle nodded at his wife, who was a French woman by birth, and laughed. The French could also do battles on the stones. It was they who cut a road out of the solid rock over the Simplon, such a road that I need only say to a child of three years old, Go down to Italy, you have only to keep in the high road, and the child will soon arrive in Italy, if he followed my directions. Then the uncle sang a French song and cried, Hurrah! Long live Napoleon Bonaparte! This was the first time Rudy had ever heard of France, or of Lyons, that great city on the Rhone where his uncle had once lived. His uncle said that Rudy, in a very few years, would become a clever hunter. He had quite a talent for it. He taught the boy to hold a gun properly, and to load and fire it. In the hunting season, he took him to the hills and made him drink the warm blood of the chamois, which is said to prevent the hunter from becoming giddy. He taught him to know the time when, from the different mountains, the avalanche is likely to fall, namely at noontide or in the evening, from the effects of the sun's rays. He made him observe the movements of the chamois when he gave a leap, so that he might fall firmly and lightly on his feet. 
He told him that when on the fissures of the rocks he could find no place for his feet, he must support himself on his elbows and cling with his legs, and even lean firmly with his back, for this could be done when necessary. He told him also that the chamois are very cunning. They place lookers out on the watch, but the hunter must be more cunning than they are, and find them out by scent. One day, when Rudy went out hunting with his uncle, he hung a coat and hat on an alpine staff, and the chamois mistook it for a man, as they generally do. The mountain path was narrow here. Indeed, it was scarcely a path at all, only a kind of shelf close to the yawning abyss. The snow that lay upon it was partially thawed, and the stones crumbled beneath the feet. Every fragment of stone broken off struck the sides of the rock in its fall, till it rolled into the depths beneath and sunk to rest. Upon this shelf, Rudy's uncle laid himself down and crept forward. At about a hundred paces behind him stood Rudy, upon the highest point of the rock, watching a great vulture hovering in the air. With a single stroke of his wing, the bird might easily cast the creeping hunter into the abyss beneath and make him his prey. Rudy's uncle had eyes for nothing but the chamois, who, with its young kid, had just appeared round the edge of the rock. So Rudy kept his eyes fixed on the bird. He knew well what the great creature wanted. Therefore, he stood in readiness to discharge his gun at the proper moment. Suddenly, the chamois made a spring, and his uncle fired and struck the animal with a deadly bullet, while the young kid rushed away, as if for a long life he had been accustomed to danger and practiced flight. The large bird, alarmed at the report of the gun, wheeled off in another direction, and Rudy's uncle was saved from danger, of which he knew nothing till he was told of it by the boy. While they were both in pleasant mood, wending their way homewards, and the uncle whistling the tune of a song he had learnt in his young days, they suddenly heard a peculiar sound which seemed to come from the top of the mountain. They looked up and saw above them on the overhanging rock the snow covering heave and lift itself as a piece of linen stretched on the ground to dry raises itself when the wind creeps under it. Smooth as polished marble slabs, the waves of snow cracked and loosened themselves, and then suddenly, with a rumbling noise of distant thunder, fell like a foaming cataract into the abyss. An avalanche had fallen, not upon Rudy and his uncle, but very near them. Alas, a great deal too near. Hold fast, Rudy, cried his uncle. Hold fast with all your might. Then Rudy clung with his arms to the trunk of the nearest tree, while his uncle climbed above him and held fast by the branches. The avalanche rolled past them at some distance, but the gust of wind that followed, like the storm wings of the avalanche, snapped asunder the trees and bushes over which it swept, as if they had been but dry rushes, and threw them about in every direction. The tree to which Rudy clung was thus overthrown, and Rudy dashed to the ground. The higher branches were snapped off and carried away to a great distance, and among these shattered branches lay Rudy's uncle, with his skull fractured. When they found him, his hand was still warm, but it would have been impossible to recognize his face. Rudy stood by, pale and trembling. It was the first shock of his life, the first time he had ever felt fear. Late in the evening, he returned home with the fatal news, to that home which was now to be so full of sorrow. His uncle's wife uttered not a word, nor shed a tear, till the corpse was brought in. Then her agony burst forth. The poor cretin crept away to his bed, and nothing was seen of him during the whole of the following day. Towards evening, however, he came to Rudy and said, Will you write a letter for me? Superly cannot write. Superly can only take the letters to the post. A letter for you, said Rudy. Who do you wish to write to? To the Lord Christ, he replied. What do you mean? asked Rudy. Then the poor idiot, as the cretin was often called, looked at Rudy with the most touching expression in his eyes, clasped his hands, and said solemnly and devoutly, Superly wants to send a letter to Jesus Christ, to pray him to let Superly die, and not the master of the house here. Rudy pressed his hands and replied, A letter would not reach him up above. It would not give him back whom we have lost. 
It was not, however, easy for Rudy to convince Saperly of the impossibility of doing what he wished. Now you must work for us, said his foster mother, and Rudy very soon became the entire support of the house. Chapter 4 Babette Who was the best marksman in the Canton Valais? The Chamois knew well. Save yourselves from Rudy, they might well say. And who is the handsomest marksman? Oh, it is Rudy, said the maidens, but they did not say, Save yourselves from Rudy. Neither did anxious mother say so, for he bowed to them as pleasantly as to the young girls. He was so brave and cheerful. His cheeks were brown, his teeth white, and his eyes dark and sparkling. He was now a handsome young man of twenty years. The most icy water could not deter him from swimming. He could twist and turn like a fish. None could climb like he, and he clung as firmly to the edges of the rocks as a limpet. He had strong muscular power, as could be seen when he leaped from rock to rock. He had learned this first from the cat, and more lately from the chamois. Rudy was considered the best guide over the mountains. Every one had great confidence in him. He might have made a great deal of money as guide. His uncle had also taught him the trade of a cooper. But he had no inclination for either. His delight was in chamois hunting, which also brought him plenty of money. Rudy would be a very good match, as people said, if he would not look above his own station. He was also such a famous partner in dancing that the girls often dreamt about him, and one and another thought of him even when awake. He kissed me in the dance, said Annette, the schoolmaster's daughter, to her dearest friend. But she ought not to have told this even to her dearest friend. It is not easy to keep such secrets. They are like sand in a sieve. They slip out. It was therefore soon known that Rudy, so brave and so good as he was, had kissed someone while dancing, and yet he had never kissed her who was dearest to him. Ah! Ah! said an old hunter. He has kissed Annette, has he? He has begun with A, and I suppose he will kiss through the whole alphabet. But a kiss in the dance was all the busy tongues could accuse him of. He certainly had kissed Annette, but she was not the flower of his heart. Down in the valley near Bex, among the great walnut trees by the side of a little rushing mountain stream, lived a rich miller. His dwelling house was a large building, three stories high, with little turrets. The roof was covered with chips bound together with tin plates that glittered in the sunshine and in the moonlight. The largest of the turrets had a weathercock representing an apple pierced by a glittering arrow, in memory of William Tell. The mill was a neat and well-ordered place that allowed itself to be sketched and written about, but the miller's daughter did not permit any to sketch or write about her. So at least Rudy would have said, for her image was pictured in his heart. Her eyes shone in it so brightly that quite a flame had been kindled there, and like all other fires it had burst forth so suddenly that the miller's daughter, the beautiful Babette, was quite unaware of it. Rudy had never spoken a word to her on the subject. The miller was rich, and on that account Babette stood very high, and was rather difficult to aspire to. But, said Rudy to himself, nothing is too high for a man to reach. He must climb with confidence in himself, and he will not fail. He had learnt this lesson in his youthful home. It happened once that Rudy had some business to settle at Bex. It was a long journey at that time, for the railway had not been opened. From the glaciers of the Rhone, at the foot of the Simplon, between its ever-changing mountain summits, stretches the valley of Canton Valais. Through it runs the noble river of the Rhone, which often overflows its banks, covering fields and highways and destroying everything in its course. Near the towns of Sion and St. Maurice, the valley takes a turn and bends like an elbow, and behind St. Maurice becomes so narrow that there is only space enough for the bed of the river and a narrow carriage road. An old tower stands there as if it were guardian to the Canton Valais, which ends at this point, and from it we can look across the stone bridge to the toll house on the other side, where the Canton Vaud commences. Not far from this spot stands the town of Bex, and at every step can be seen an increase of its fruitfulness and verdure. 
it is like entering a grove of chestnut and walnut trees here and there the cypress and pomegranate blossoms peep forth and it is almost as warm as an italian climate rudy arrived at bex and soon finished the business which had brought him there and then walked about the town but not even the miller's boy could be seen nor any one belonging to the mill not to mention babette this did not please him at all evening came on the air was filled with the perfume of the wild thyme and the blossoms of the lime trees and the green woods on the mountain seemed to be covered with a shining veil blue as the sky over everything reigned a stillness not of sleep or of death but as if nature were holding her breath that her image might be photographed on the blue vault of heaven here and there amidst the trees of the silent valley stood poles which supported the wires of the electric telegraph against one of these poles leaned an object so motionless that it might have been mistaken for the trunk of a tree but it was rudy standing there as still as at that moment was everything around him he was not asleep neither was he dead but just as the various events in the world matters of momentous importance to individuals were flying through the telegraph wires without the quiver of a wire or the slightest tone so through the mind of rudy thoughts of overwhelming importance were passing without an outward sign of emotion the happiness of his future life depended upon the decision of his present reflections his eyes were fixed on one spot in the distance a light that twinkled through the foliage from the parlor of the miller's house where babette dwelt rudy stood so still that it might have been supposed he was watching for a chamois but he was in reality like a chamois who will stand for a moment looking as if it were chiselled out of the rock and then if only a stone rolled by would suddenly bound forward with a spring far away from the hunter and so with rudy a sudden roll of his thoughts roused him from his stillness and made him bound forward with a determination to act never despair cried he a visit to the mill to say good evening to the miller and good evening to little babette can do no harm no one ever fails who has confidence in himself if i am to be babette's husband i must see her some time or other then rudy laughed joyously and took courage to go to the mill he knew what he wanted he wanted to marry babette the clear water of the river rolled over its yellow bed and willows and lime trees were reflected in it as rudy stepped along the path to the miller's house but as the children sing there was no one at home in the house only a kitten at play the cat standing on the steps put up its back and cried mew but rudy had no inclination for this sort of conversation he passed on and knocked at the door no one heard him no one opened the door mew said the cat again and had rudy been still a child he would have understood this language and known that the cat wished to tell him there was no one at home so he was obliged to go to the mill and make inquiries and there he heard that the miller had gone on a journey to the interlaken and had taken babette with him to the great shooting festival which began that morning and would continue for eight days and that people from all the german settlements would be there poor rudy we may well say it was not a fortunate day for his visit to bex he had just to return the way he came through st maurice and Sion, to his home in the valley but he did not despair when the sun rose the next morning his good spirits had returned indeed he had never really lost them babette is at interlaken said rudy to himself many days journey from here it is certainly a long way for any one who takes the high road but not so far if he takes a short cut across the mountain and that just suits a chamois hunter i have been that way before for it leads to the home of my childhood where as a little boy i lived with my grandfather and there are shooting matches at interlaken i will go and try to stand first in the match babette will be there and i shall be able to make her acquaintance carrying his light knapsack which contained his sunday clothes on his back and with his musket and his game bag over his shoulder rudy started to take the shortest way across the mountain still it was a great distance the shooting matches were to commence on that day and to continue for a whole week 
he had been told also that the miller and babette would remain that time with some relatives at inchlochen so over the gemmi rudy climbed bravely and determined to descend the side of the grindenwald bright and joyous were his feelings as he stepped lightly onwards inhaling the invigorating mountain air the valley sunk as he ascended the circle of the horizon expanded one snow-capped peak after another rose before him till the whole of the glittering alpine range became visible rudy knew each ice-clad peak and he continued his course towards the shrekhorn with its white powdered stone finger raised high in the air at length he had crossed the highest ridges and before him lay the green pasture lands sloping down towards the valley which was once his home the buoyancy of the air made his heart light hill and valley were blooming in luxuriant beauty and his thoughts were youthful dreams in which old age or death were out of the question life power and enjoyment were in the future and he felt free and light as a bird and the swallows flew around him as in the days of his childhood singing we and you you and we all was overflowing with joy beneath him lay the meadows covered with velvety green with the murmuring river flowing through them and dotted here and there were small wooden houses he could see the edges of glaciers looking like green glass against the soiled snow and the deep chasms beneath the loftiest glacier the church bells were ringing as if to welcome him to his home with their sweet tones his heart beat quickly and for a moment he seemed to have forgotten babette so full were his thoughts of old recollections he was in imagination once more wandering on the road where when a little boy he with other children came to sell their curiously carved toy houses yonder behind the fir trees still stood his grandfather's house his mother's father but strangers dwelt in it now children came running to him as he had once done and wished to sell their wares one of them offered him an alpine rose but rudy took the rose as a good omen and thought of babette he quickly crossed the bridge where the two rivers flow into each other here he found a walk overshadowed with large walnut trees and their thick foliage formed a pleasant shade very soon he perceived in the distance waving flags on which glittered a white cross on a red ground the standard of the danes as well as of the swiss and before him lay interlaken it is really a splendid town like none other that i have ever seen said rudy to himself it was indeed a swiss town in its holiday dress not like many other towns crowded with heavy stone houses stiff and foreign-looking no here it seemed as if the wooden houses on the hills had run into the valley and placed themselves in rows and ranks by the side of the clear river which rushes like an arrow in its course the streets were rather irregular it is true but still this added to their picturesque appearance there was one street which rudy thought the prettiest of them all it had been built since he had visited the town when a little boy it seemed to him as if all the neatest and most curiously carved toy houses which his grandfather once kept in the large cupboard at home had been brought out and placed in this spot and that they had increased in size since then as the chestnut trees had done the houses were called hotels the woodwork on the windows and the balconies was curiously carved the roofs were gaily painted and before each house was a flower garden which separated it from the macadamized high road these houses all stood on the same side of the road so that the fresh green meadows in which were cows grazing with bells on their necks were not hidden the sound of these bells is often heard amidst the alpine scenery these meadows were encircled by lofty hills which receded a little in the centre so that the most beautifully formed of swiss mountains the snow-crowned jungfrau could be distinctly seen glittering in the distance a number of elegantly dressed gentlemen and ladies from foreign lands and crowds of country people from the neighbouring cantons were assembled in the town each marksman wore the number of hits he had made twisted in a garland round his hat here were music and singing of all descriptions hand organs trumpets shouting and noise the houses and bridges were adorned with verses and inscriptions flags and banners were waving shot after shot was fired which was the best music to rudy's ears 
and amidst all this excitement he quite forgot babette on whose account only he had come the shooters were thronging round the target and rudy was soon amongst them but when he took his turn to fire he proved himself the best shot for he always struck the bull's-eye who may that young stranger be was the inquiry on all sides he speaks french as it is spoken in the swiss cantons and makes himself understood very well when he speaks german said some he lived here when a child with his grandfather in a house on the road in grindenwald remarked one of the sportsmen and full of life was this young stranger his eyes sparkled his glance was steady and his arm sure therefore he always hit the mark good fortune gives good courage and rudy was always courageous he soon had a circle of friends gathered around him everyone noticed him and did him homage babette had quite vanished from his thoughts when he was struck on the shoulder by a heavy hand and a deep voice said to him in french you are from canton valais rudy turned around and beheld a man with a ruddy pleasant face and a stout figure it was the rich miller from bex his broad portly person hid the slender lovely babette but she came forward and glanced at him with her bright dark eyes the rich miller was very much flattered at the thought that the young man who was acknowledged to be the best shot and was so praised by every one should be from his own canton now was rudy really fortunate he had travelled all this way to this place and those he had forgotten were now come to seek him when country people go far from home they often meet with those they know and improve their acquaintance rudy by his shooting had gained the first place in the shooting match just as the miller at home at bex stood first because of his money in his mill so that the two men shook hands which they had never done before babette too held out her hand to rudy frankly and he pressed it in his and looked at her so earnestly that she blushed deeply the miller talked of the long journey they had travelled and of the many towns they had seen it was his opinion that he had really made as great a journey as if he had travelled in a steamship a railway carriage or a post-chaise i came by a much shorter way said rudy i came over the mountains there is no road so high that a man may not venture upon it ah yes it break your neck said the miller and you look like one who will break his neck some day you are so daring oh nothing ever happens to a man if he has confidence in himself replied rudy the miller's relations at interlaken with whom the miller and babette were staying invited rudy to visit them when they found he came from the same canton as the miller it was a most pleasant visit good fortune seemed to follow him as it does those who think and act for themselves and who remember the proverb nuts are given to us but they are not cracked for us and rudy was treated by the miller's relation almost like one of the family and glasses of wine were poured out to drink to the welfare of the best shooter babette clinked glasses with rudy and he returned thanks for the toast in the evening they all took a delightful walk under the walnut trees in front of the stately hotels there were so many people in such crowding that rudy was obliged to offer his arm to babette then he told her how happy it made him to meet people from the canton vaud for vaud and valet were neighboring cantons he spoke of this pleasure so heartily that babette could not resist giving his arm a slight squeeze and so they walked on together and talked and chatted like old acquaintances rudy felt inclined to laugh sometimes at the absurd dress and walk of the foreign ladies but babette did not wish to make fun of them for she knew there must be some good excellent people amongst them she herself had a godmother who was a high-born english lady eighteen years before when babette was christened this lady was staying at bex and she stood godmother for her and gave her the valuable brooch she now wore in her bosom her godmother had twice written to her and this year she was expecting to visit interlaken with her two daughters but they are old maids added babette who was only eighteen they are nearly thirty her sweet little mouth was never still a moment and all that she said sounded in rudy's ears as matters of the greatest importance and at last he told her what he was longing to tell how often he had been at bex how well he knew the mill and how often he had seen babette 
when most likely she had not noticed him. And lastly, that full of many thoughts which he could not tell her, he had been to the mill on the evening when she and her father had started on their long journey, but not too far for him to find a way to overtake them. He told her all this and a great deal more. He told her how much he could endure for her, and that it was to see her and not the shooting match which had brought him to Interlaken. Babette became quite silent after hearing all this. It was almost too much, and it troubled her. And while they thus wandered on, the sun sunk behind the lofty mountains. The Jungfrau stood out in brightness and splendor as a background to the green woods of the surrounding hills. Everyone stood to look at the beautiful sight, Rudy and Babette among them. Nothing could be more beautiful than this, said Babette. Nothing, replied Rudy, looking at Babette. Tomorrow I must return home, remarked Rudy a few minutes afterwards. Come and visit us at Bex, whispered Babette. My father will be pleased to see you. Chapter 5 On the Way Home Oh, what a number of things Rudy had to carry over the mountains when he set out to return home. He had three silver cups, two handsome pistols, and a silver coffee pot. This latter would be useful when he began housekeeping. But all these were not the heaviest weight he had to bear. Something mightier and more important he carried with him in his heart over the high mountains as he journeyed homeward. The weather was dismally dark and inclined to rain. The clouds hung low like a morning veil on the top of the mountains and shrouded their glittering peaks. In the woods could be heard the sound of the axe and the heavy fall of the trunks of the trees as they rolled down the slopes of the mountains. When seen from the heights, the trunk of these trees looked like slender stems, but on a nearer inspection they were found to be large and strong enough for the masts of a ship. The river murmured monotonously, the wind whistled, and the clouds sailed along hurriedly. Suddenly there appeared, close by Rudy's side, a young maiden. He had not noticed her till she came quite near to him. She was also going to ascend the mountain. The maiden's eyes shone with an unearthly power, which obliged you to look into them. They were strange eyes, clear, deep, and unfathomable. "'Hast thou a lover?' asked Rudy. All his thoughts were naturally on love just then. "'I have none,' answered the maiden with a laugh. It was as if she had not spoken the truth. "'Do not let us go such a long way around," said she. "'We must keep to the left.' It is much shorter. Ah, yes, he replied, and fall into some crevice. Do you pretend to be a guide and not know the road better than that? I know every step of the way, said she, and my thoughts are collected, while yours are down in the valley yonder. We should think of the ice maiden while we're up here. Men say she is not kind to their race. I fear her not, said Rudy. She could not keep me when I was a child. I will not give myself up to her now I'm a man. Darkness came on, the rain fell, and then it began to snow, and the whiteness dazzled the eyes. Give me your hand, said the maiden. I will help you to mount, and he felt the touch of her icy fingers. You help me? cried Rudy. I do not yet require a woman to help me to climb. And he stepped quickly forwards away from her. The drifting snow shower fell like a veil between them. The wind whistled, and behind them he could hear the maiden laughing and singing, and the sound was most strange to hear. It certainly must be a specter or a servant of the ice maiden, thought Rudy, who had heard such things talked about when he was a boy and had stayed all night on the mountain with the guides. The snow fell thicker than ever. The clouds lay beneath them. He looked back. There was no one to be seen, but he heard sounds of mocking laughter, which were not those of a human voice. When Rudy at length reached the highest part of the mountain, where the path led down to the valley of the Rhone, the snow had ceased, and in the clear heavens he saw two bright stars twinkling. They reminded him of Babette, and of himself, and of his future happiness, and his heart glowed at the thought. Chapter 6 The Visit to the Mill What beautiful things you've brought home, said his old foster-mother 
and her strange-looking eagle eyes sparkled while she wriggled and twisted her skinny neck more quickly and strangely than ever. "'You have brought good luck with you, Rudy. I must give you a kiss, my dear boy.' Rudy allowed himself to be kissed, but it could be seen by his countenance that he only endured the infliction as a homely duty. "'How handsome you are, Rudy,' said the old woman. "'Ah, oh, don't flatter,' said Rudy, with a laugh, but still he was pleased. "'I must say once more,' said the old woman, "'that you are very lucky.' "'Well, in that I believe you are right,' said he, as he thought of Babette. Never had he felt such longing for that deep valley as he now had. "'They must have returned home by this time,' said he to himself. "'It's already two days over the time which they fixed upon. I must go to Beck's. So Rudy set out to go to Beck's, and when he arrived there he found the miller and his daughter at home. They received him kindly, and brought him many greetings from their friends at Interlaken. Babette did not say much. She seemed to have become quite silent, but her eyes spoke, and that was quite enough for Rudy. The miller had generally a great deal to talk about, and seemed to expect that everyone should listen to his jokes and laugh at them, for was he not the rich miller? but now he was more inclined to hear Rudy's adventures while hunting and travelling, and to listen to his descriptions of the difficulties the chamois hunter has to overcome on the mountain tops, or of the dangerous snowdrifts which the wind and weather cause to cling to the edges of the rock, or to lie in the form of a frail bridge over the abyss beneath. The eyes of the brave Rudy sparkled as he described the life of a hunter, or spoke of the cunning of the chamois and their wonderful leaps also of the powerful phone in the rolling avalanche. He noticed that the more he described, the more interested the miller became, especially when he spoke of the fierce vulture and of the royal eagle. Not far from Bex in the Canton Valais was an eagle's nest, more curiously built under a high, overhanging rock. In this nest was a young eagle, but who would venture to take it? A young Englishman had offered Rudy a whole handful of gold, if he would bring him the young eagle alive. There is a limit to everything, was Rudy's reply. The eagle could not be taken. It would be folly to attempt it. The wine had passed round freely, and the conversation kept up pleasantly, but the evening seemed too short for Rudy, although it was midnight when he left the miller's house after this his first visit. While the lights in the windows of the miller's house still twinkled through the green foliage, out through the open skylight came the parlor cat on to the roof, and along the water pipe walked the kitchen cat to meet her. "'What's the news at the mill?' asked the parlor cat. "'Here in the house there's a secret love-making going on which the father knows nothing about. Rudy and Babette have been treading on each other's paws under the table all evening. They trod on my tail twice, but I did not mew. That would have attracted notice.' Well, I should have mewed, said the kitchen cat. What might suit the kitchen would not suit the parlor, said the other. I'm quite curious to know what the miller will say when he finds out this engagement. Yes, indeed, what the miller would say? Rudy himself was anxious to know that, but to wait till the miller heard of it from the others was out of the question. Therefore, not many days after this visit, he was riding in the omnibus that runs between the two cantons, Valais and Vaud, these cantons are separated by the Rhone, over which is a bridge that unites them. Rudy, as usual, had plenty of courage, and indulged in pleasant thoughts of the favorable answer he should receive that evening. And when the omnibus returned, Rudy was again seated in it, going homewards, and at the same time the parlor cat at the miller's house ran out quickly, crying. Here, you from the kitchen, what do you think? The miller knows all now. Everything has come to a delightful end. Rudy came here this evening, and he and Babette had much whispering and secret conversation together. They stood in the path near the miller's room. I lay at their feet, but they had no eyes or thoughts for me. I will go to your father at once, said he. It is the most honorable way. Shall I go with you? asked Babette. It will give you courage. I have plenty of courage, said Rudy. But if you are with me, he must be friendly, whether he says yes or no. So they turned to go in, and Rudy trod heavily on my tail. He certainly is very clumsy. I mewed, but neither he nor Babette had any ears for me. 
They opened the door and entered together. I was before them and jumped on the back of the chair. I hardly know what Rudy said, but the miller flew into a rage and threatened to kick him out of the house. He told me he might go to the mountains and look after Chamoy, but not after our little Babette. And what did they say? Did they speak? asked the kitchen cat. What did they say? Why, all that people generally do say when they go a wooing. I love her, and she loves me, and when there is milk in the can for one, there is milk in the can for two. But she is so far above you, said the miller. She has heaps of gold, as you know. You should not attempt to reach her. There is nothing so high that a man cannot reach if he will, answered Rudy, for he is a brave youth. Yet you could not reach the young eagle, said the miller, laughing. Babette is higher than the eagle's nest. I will have them both, said Rudy. Very well. I will give her to you when you bring me the young eaglet, alive, said the miller, and he laughed till the tears stood in his eyes. But now I thank you for this visit, Rudy, and if you come tomorrow you will find nobody at home. Good-bye, Rudy. Babette also wished him farewell, but her voice sounded as mournful as the mew of a little kitten that had lost its mother. A promise is a promise between man and man, said Rudy. Do not weep, Babette. I shall bring the young eagle. You will break your neck, I hope, said the miller, and we shall be relieved from your company. I call that kicking him out of the house, said the parlor cat, and now Rudy is gone and Babette sits and weeps, while the miller sings German songs that he learnt on his journey. But I do not trouble myself on the matter. It would be of no use. Yet for all that, it is a very strange affair, said the kitchen cat. Chapter 7 The Eagle's Nest From the mountain path came a joyous sound of some person whistling, and it betokened good humor and undaunted courage. It was Rudy going to meet his friend Vesenod. You must come and help, said he. I want to carry off the young eaglet from the top of the rock. We will take young Rogley with us. Had you better not first try to take down the moon? That would be quite as easy a task, said Vesenod. You seem to be in good spirits. Yes, indeed I am. I'm thinking of my wedding. But to be serious, I will tell you about it and how I am situated. Then he explained to Vesenod and Rogli what he wished to do and why. You are a daring fellow, said they, but it is no use. You will break your neck. No one falls unless he is afraid, said Rudy. So at midnight they set out, carrying with them poles, ladders, and ropes. The road lay amidst brushwood and underwood, over rolling stones always upwards higher and higher in the dark night. Waters roared beneath them or fell in cascades from above. Humid clouds were driving through the air as the hunters reached the precipitous ledge of the rock. It was even darker here for the sides of the rock almost met, and the light penetrated only through a small opening at the top. At a little distance from the edge could be heard the sound of the roaring, foaming waters in the yawning abyss beneath them. The three seated themselves on a stone to await in silence the dawn of day, when the parent eagle would fly out as it would be necessary to shoot the old bird before they could think of gaining possession of the young one. Rudy sat motionless, as if he had been part of the stone on which he sat. He held his gun ready to fire, with his eyes fixed steadily on the highest point of the cliff, where the eagle's nest lay concealed beneath the overhanging rock. The three hunters had a long time to wait. At last they heard a rustling, whirring sound above them, and a large hovering object darkened the air. Two guns were ready to aim at the dark body of the eagle as it rose from the nest. Then a shot was fired. For an instant the bird fluttered its wide-spreading wings, and it seemed as if it would fill up the hole of the chasm and drag down the hunters in its fall. But it was not so. The eagle sunk gradually into the abyss beneath, and the branches of trees and brushes were broken by its weight. Then the hunters roused themselves. Three of the longest ladders were brought and bound together. The topmost ring of these ladders would just reach beneath the edge of the rock which hung over the abyss, but no further. The point beneath which the eagle's nest lay sheltered was much higher, and the sides of the rock were as smooth as a wall. After consulting together, 
they determined to bind together two more ladders and to hoist them over the cavity and so form a communication with the three beneath them by binding the upper ones to the lower. With great difficulty they contrived to drag the two ladders over the rock, and there they hung for some moments swaying over the abyss. But no sooner had they fastened them together than Rudy placed his foot on the lowest step. It was a bitterly cold morning. Clouds of mist were rising from beneath, and Rudy stood on the lower step of the ladder as a fly rests on a piece of swinging straw which a bird may have dropped from the edge of the nest it was building on some tall factory chimney. But the fly could fly away if the straw were shaken. Rudy could only break his neck. The wind whistled around him, and beneath him the waters of the abyss, swelled by the thawing of the glaciers, those palaces of the ice maiden, foamed and roared in their rapid course. When Rudy began to ascend, the ladder trembled like the web of the spider, when it draws out the long, delicate threads. But as soon as he reached the fourth of the ladders, which had been bound together, he felt more confidence. He knew that they had been fastened securely by skillful hands. The fifth ladder, that appeared to reach the nest, was supported by the sides of the rock, yet it swung to and fro, and flapped about like a slender reed as if it had been bound by fishing lines. It seemed a most dangerous undertaking to ascend it, but Rudy knew how to climb. He had learnt that from the cat, and he had no fear. He did not observe Vertigo, who stood in the air behind him, trying to lay hold of him with his outstretched, polypus arms. When at length he stood on the topmost step of the ladder, he found that he was still some distance below the nest, and not even able to see into it. Only by using his hands and climbing could he possibly reach it. He tried the strength of the stunted trees and the thick underwood upon which the nest rested and of which it was formed, and finding they would support his weight he grasped them firmly and swung himself up from the ladder till his hand and breast were above the nest. And then what an overpowering stench came from it, for in it lay the putrid remains of lambs, chamois, and birds. Vertigo, although he could not reach him, blew the poisonous vapor in his face to make him giddy and faint, and beneath in the dark yawning deep on the rushing waters sat the ice maiden, with her long pale green hair falling around her and her death-like eyes fixed upon him, like the two barrels of a gun. I have thee now, she cried. In a corner of the eagle's nest sat the young eaglet, a large and powerful bird, though still unable to fly. Rudy fixed his eyes upon it, held on by one hand with all his strength, and with the other threw a noose round the young eagle. The string slipped to its legs, Rudy tightened it, and thus secured the bird alive. Then flinging the sling over his shoulder so that the creature hung a good way down behind him, he prepared to descend with the help of a rope, and his foot soon touched safely the highest step of the ladder. Then Rudy, remembering his early lesson in climbing, hold fast and do not fear, descended carefully down the ladder, and at last stood safely on the ground with the young living eaglet, where he was received with loud shouts of joy and congratulations. 8. What Fresh News the Parlor Cat Had to Tell there is what you asked for, said Rudy, as he entered the miller's house at Beck's, and placed on the floor a large basket. He removed the lid as he spoke, and a pair of yellow eyes, encircled by a black ring, stared forth with a wild, fiery glance that seemed ready to burn and destroy all that came in its way. Its short, strong beak was open, ready to bite and on its red throat were short feathers like stubble. "'The young eaglet!' cried the miller. Babette screamed and started back, while her eyes wandered from Rudy to the bird in astonishment. "'You are not to be discouraged by difficulties, I see,' said the miller. "'And you will keep your word,' replied Rudy. "'Each has his own characteristic, whether it is honor or courage. "'But how is it that you did not break your neck?' asked the miller. 
because I held fast, answered Rudy, and I mean to hold fast to Babette. You must get her first, said the miller, laughing, and Babette thought this was a very good sign. We must take the bird out of the basket, said she. It is getting into a rage. How its eyes glare! How did you manage to conquer it? Then Rudy had to describe his adventure, and the miller's eyes opened wide as he listened. With your courage and your good fortune, you might win three wives, said the miller. Oh, thank you, cried Rudy. But you have not won Babette yet, said the miller, slapping the young alpine hunter on the shoulder playfully. Have you heard the fresh news at the mill? asked the parlor cat of the kitchen cat. Rudy has brought us the young eagle, and he is to take Babette in exchange. They kissed each other in the presence of the old man, which is as good as an engagement. He was quite civil about it, drew in his claws, and took his afternoon nap, so that the two were left to sit and wag their tails as much as they pleased. They have so much to talk about that it will not be finished till Christmas. Neither was it finished till Christmas. The wind whirled the faded, fallen leaves, the snow drifted in the valleys as well as upon the mountains, and the ice maiden sat in the stately palace which in winter time she generally occupied. The perpendicular rocks were covered with slippery ice, and where in summer the stream from the rocks had left a watery veil, icicles large and heavy hung from the trees while the snow-powdered fir-trees were decorated with fantastic garlands of crystal. The ice-maiden rode on the howling wind across the deep valleys. The country as far as Bex was covered with a carpet of snow, so that the ice-maiden could follow Rudy and see him when he visited the mill. And while in the room at the miller's house, where he was accustomed to spend so much of his time with Babette, the wedding was to take place in the following summer, and they heard enough of it, for so many of their friends spoke of the matter. Then came sunshine to the mill. The beautiful alpine roses bloomed, and joyous, laughing Babette was like the early spring, which made all the birds sing of summer time and bridal days. How those two do sit and chatter together, said the parlor cat. I have had enough of their mewing. 9. The Ice Maiden The walnut and chestnut trees, which extend from the bridges of St. Maurice by the river Rhone to the shores of the Lake of Geneva, were already covered with the delicate green garlands of early spring, just bursting into bloom, while the Rhone rushed wildly from its source among the green glaciers which form the ice palace of the ice maiden. She sometimes allows herself to be carried by the keen wind to the lofty snowfields, where she stretches herself in the sunshine on the soft snowy cushions. From thence she throws her far-seeing glance into the deep valley beneath, where human beings are busily moving about like ants on a stone in the sun. Spirits of strength, as the children of the sun called you, cried the ice maiden, ye are but worms. Let but a snowball roll, and you and your houses and your towns are crushed and swept away. And she raised her proud head, and looked around her with eyes that flashed death from their glance. From the valley came a rumbling sound. Men were busily at work blasting the rocks to form tunnels and laying down roads for the railway. They are playing at work underground like moles, said she. They are digging passages beneath the earth, and the noise is like the reports of cannons. I shall throw down my palaces, for the clamor is louder than the roar of thunder. Then there ascended from the valley a thick vapor, which waved itself in the air like a fluttering veil. It rose as a plume of feathers from a steam engine, to which, on the lately opened railway, a string of carriages was linked, carriage to carriage, looking like a winding serpent. 
the train shot past with the speed of an arrow. They play at being masters down there, those spirits of strength, exclaimed the ice maiden, but the powers of nature are still the rulers. And she laughed and sang till her voice sounded through the valley, and people said it was the rolling of an avalanche. But the children of the sun sang in louder strains in praise of the mind of man, which can span the sea as with a yoke, can level mountains, and fill up valleys. It is the power of thought which gives man the mastery over nature. Just at this moment there came across the snowfield where the ice maiden sat, a party of travellers. They had bound themselves fast to each other, so that they looked like one large body on the slippery plains of ice encircling the deep abyss. Worms! exclaimed the ice maiden. You, the lords of the powers of nature! And she turned away and looked maliciously at the deep valley where the railway train was rushing by. There they sit, these thoughts, she exclaimed. There they sit in their power over nature's strength. I see them all. One sits proudly apart like a king. Others sit together in a group. Yonder, half of them are asleep, and when the stream dragon stops, they will get out and go their way. The thoughts go forth into the world. And she laughed. There goes another avalanche, said those in the valley beneath. It will not reach us said two who sat together behind the steam dragon. Two hearts in one beat, as people say. They were Rudy and Babette, and the miller was with them. I am like the luggage, said he. I am here as a necessary appendage. There sit those two, said the ice maiden. Many a chamois have I crushed. Millions of alpine roses have I snapped and broken off. Not a root have I spared. I know them all and their thoughts, those spirits of strength. And again she laughed. There rules another avalanche, said those in the valley. 10. The Godmother At Montreux, one of the towns which encircle the northeast part of the Lake of Geneva, lived Babette's godmother, the noble English lady with her daughters and a young relative. They had only lately arrived, yet the miller had paid them a visit, and informed them of Babette's engagement to Rudy. The whole story of their meeting at Interlachen, and his brave adventure with the eaglet, were related to them, and they were all very much interested, and as pleased about Rudy and Babette as the miller himself. The three were invited to come to Montreux. It was but right for Babette to become acquainted with her godmother, who wished to see her very much. A steamboat started from the town of Villeneuve at one end of the Lake of Geneva and arrived at Bernex, a little town beyond Monto, in about half an hour. And in this boat, the miller, with his daughter and Rudy, set out to visit her godmother. They passed the coast which has been so celebrated in song. Here, under the walnut trees, by the deep blue lake, sat Byron, and wrote his melodious verses about the prisoner confined in the gloomy castle of Chillon. Here, where Clarence, with its weeping willows, is reflected in the clear water, wandered Rousseau dreaming of Heloise. The river Rhone glides gently by beneath the lofty snow-capped hills of Savoy, and not far from its mouth lies a little island in the lake, so small that, seen from the shore, it looks like a ship. The surface of the island is rocky, and about a hundred years ago, a lady caused the ground to be covered with earth, in which three arcacia trees were planted, and the whole enclosed with the stone walls. The arcacia trees now overshadow every part of the island, 
Babette was enchanted with the spot. It seemed to her the most beautiful object in the whole voyage, and she thought how much she should like to land there. But the steamship passed it by, and did not stop till it reached Burnex. The little party walked slowly from this place to Monto, passing the sunlit walls with which the vineyards of the little mountain town of Monto are surrounded, and peasants' houses, overshadowed by fig trees, with gardens in which grow the laurel and the cypress. Halfway up the hill stood the boarding house in which Babette's godmother resided. She was received most cordially. Her godmother was a very friendly woman, with a round, smiling countenance. When a child, her head must have resembled one of Raphael's cherubs. It was still an angelic face, with its white locks of silvery hair. The daughters were tall, elegant, slender maidens. The young cousin, whom they had brought with them, was dressed in white from head to foot. He had golden hair and golden whiskers, large enough to be divided amongst three gentlemen, and he began immediately to pay the greatest attention to Babette. Richly bound books, note-paper, and drawings lay on the large table. The balcony window stood open, and from it could be seen the beautiful, wide, extended lake, the water so clear and still that the mountains of Savoy, with their villages, woods, and snow-crowned peaks, were clearly reflected in it. Rudy, who was usually so lively and brave, did not in the least feel himself at home. He acted as if he were walking on peas, over a slippery floor, how long and wearisome the time appeared! It was like being in a treadmill. And then they went out for a walk, which was very slow and tedious. Two steps forward, and one backwards, had Rudy to take to keep pace with the others. They walked down to Chillon, and went over the old castle on the rocky island. They saw the implements of torture the deadly dungeons, the rusty fetters in the rocky walls, the stone benches for those condemned to death, the trap doors through which the unhappy creatures were hurled upon iron spikes and impaled alive. They called looking at all these a pleasure. It certainly was the right place to visit. Byron's poetry had made it celebrated in the world. Rudy could only feel that it was a place of execution. He leaned against the stone framework of the window, and gazed down into the deep blue water, and over to the little island with the three Arcasias, and wished himself there, away and free from the whole chattering party. But Babette was most unusually lively and good-tempered. "'I have been so amused,' she said. The cousin had found her quite perfect. "'He is a perfect fop,' said Rudy, and this was the first time Rudy had said anything that did not please Babette. The Englishman had made her a present of a little book in remembrance of their visit to Chillon. It was Byron's poem, The Prisoner of Chillon, translated into French, so that Babette could read it. "'The book may be very good,' said Rudy, but that finely combed fellow who gave it to you is not worth much. He looks something like a flour sack without any flour, said the miller, laughing in his own wit. Rudy laughed, too, for so had he appeared to him. 11. The Cousin When Rudy went a few days after to pay a visit to the mill, he found the young Englishman there. Babette was just thinking of preparing some trout to set before him. She understood well how to garnish the dish with parsley and make it look quite tempting. Rudy thought all this quite unnecessary. What did the Englishman want there? What was he about? 
Why should he be entertained and waited upon by Babette? Rudy was jealous, and that made Babette happy. It amused her to discover all the feelings of his heart, the strong points and weak ones. Love was to her as yet only a pastime, and she played with Rudy's whole heart. At the same time, it must be acknowledged that her fortune, her whole life, her inmost thoughts, her best and most noble feelings in this world were all for him. Still, the more gloomy he looked, the more her eyes laughed. She could almost have kissed the fair Englishman with the golden whiskers, if by doing so she could have put Rudy in a rage, and made him run out of the house. That would have proved how much he loved her. All this was not right in Babette, but she was only nineteen years of age, and she did not reflect on what she did. Neither did she think that her conduct would appear to the young Englishman as light, and not even becoming the modest and much-loved daughter of the miller. The mill at Bex stood in the highway, which passed under the snow-clad mountains, and not far from a rapid mountain stream, whose waters seemed to have been lashed into a foam like soap suds. This stream, however, did not pass near enough to the mill, and therefore the mill wheel was turned by a smaller stream, which tumbled down the rocks on the opposite side, where it was opposed by a stone mill dam, and obtained greater strength and speed, till it fell into a large basin and from thence through a channel to the mill-wheel. This channel sometimes overflowed, and made the path so slippery that anyone passing that way might easily fall in, and be carried towards the mill-wheel with frightful rapidity. Such a catastrophe nearly happened to the young Englishman. He had dressed himself in white clothes, like a miller's man, and was climbing the path to the miller's house. But he had never been taught to climb, and therefore slipped, and nearly went in head foremost. He managed, however, to scramble out with wet sleeves and bespattered trousers. Still, wet and splashed with mud, he contrived to reach Babette's window, to which he had been guided by the light that shone from it. Here he climbed the old linden tree that stood near it, and began to imitate the voice of an owl, the only bird he could venture to mimic. Babette heard the noise, and glanced through the thin window curtain. But when she saw the man in white, and guessed who he was, her little heart beat with terror as well as anger. She quickly put out the light, felt if the fastening of the window was secure and then left him to howl as long as he liked. How dreadful it would be, thought Babette, if Rudy were here in the house. But Rudy was not in the house. No, it was much worse. He was outside, standing just under the linden tree. He was speaking loud, angry words. He could fight, and there might be murder. Babette opened the window in alarm, and called Rudy's name. She told him to go away. She did not wish him to remain there. "'You do not wish me to stay,' cried he. "'Then this is an appointment you expected. This good friend whom you prefer to me. Shame on you, Babette!' "'You are detestable!' exclaimed Babette, bursting into tears. "'Go away! I hate you!' "'I have not deserved this,' said Rudy, as he turned away, his cheeks burning and his heart like fire. Babette threw herself on the bed and wept bitterly. So much as I loved thee, Rudy, and yet thou canst think ill of me. Thus her anger broke forth. It relieved her, however, otherwise she would have been more deeply grieved. But now she could sleep soundly, as youth only can sleep. 12. Evil Powers Rudy left Bex and took his way home along the mountain path. The air was fresh, but cold, for here amidst the deep snow the ice maiden reigned. He was so high up that the large trees beneath him, with their thick foliage 
appeared like garden plants, and the pines and bushes even less. The alpine roses grew near the snow, which lay in detached stripes, and looked like linen laid out to bleach. A blue gentilian grew in his path, and he crushed it with the butt-end of his gun. A little higher up, he espied two chamois. Rudy's eyes glistened, and his thoughts flew at once in a different direction. But he was not near enough to take a sure aim. He ascended still higher, to a spot where a few rough blades of grass grew between the blocks of stone, and the chamois passed quietly on over the snowfields. Rudy walked hurriedly, while the clouds of mist gathered round him. Suddenly he found himself on the brink of a precipitous rock. The rain was falling in torrents. He felt a burning thirst. His head was hot, and his limbs trembled with cold. He seized his hunting flask, but it was empty. He had not thought of filling it before ascending the mountain. He had never been ill in his life, nor ever experienced such sensations as those he now felt. He was so tired that he could scarcely resist lying down at his full length to sleep, although the ground was flooded with rain. Yet when he tried to rouse himself a little, every object around him danced and trembled before his eyes. Suddenly he observed in the doorway of a hut newly built under the rock a young maiden. He did not remember having seen this hut before, yet there it stood, and he thought, first, that the young maiden was Annette, the schoolmaster's daughter, whom he had once kissed in the dance. The maiden was not Annette, yet it seemed as if he had seen her somewhere before perhaps near Grindward, on the evening of his return home from Interlachen, after the shooting match. "'How did you come here?' he asked. "'I am at home,' she replied. "'I am watching my flocks.' "'Your flocks!' he exclaimed. "'Where do they find pasture? There is nothing here but snow and rock. "'Much you know of what grows here,' she replied, laughing. "'Not far beneath us there is beautiful pasture-land. "'My goats go there. "'I tend them carefully. "'I never miss one. "'What is once mine remains mine.' "'You are bold,' said Rudy. "'And so are you,' she answered. "'Have you any milk in the house?' he asked. "'If so, give me some to drink. "'My thirst is intolerable.' I have something better than milk, she replied, which I will give you. Some travellers who were here yesterday with their guide left behind them a half a flask of wine, such as you have never tasted. They will not come back to fetch it. I know, and I shall not drink it. So you shall have it. Then the maiden went to fetch the wine, poured some into a wooden cup, and offered it to Rudy. "'How good it is!' said he. "'I have never before tasted such warm, invigorating wine.' And his eyes sparkled with new life. A glow diffused itself over his frame. It seemed as if every sorrow, every oppression, were banished from his mind, and a fresh, free nature was stirring within him. "'You are surely Annette, the schoolmaster's daughter,' cried he. "'Will you give me a kiss?' Yes, if you will give me that beautiful ring which you wear on your finger. My betrothal ring, he replied. Yes, just so, said the maiden, as she poured out some more wine and held it to his lips. Again he drank, and a living joy streamed through every vein. The whole world is mine. Why, therefore, should I grieve, thought he. Everything is created for our enjoyment and happiness. The stream of life is a stream of happiness. Let us flow on with it to joy and felicity. Rudy gazed on the young maiden. It was Annette. And yet, it was not Annette. 
Still less did he suppose it was the spectral phantom whom he had met near Grendelwald. The maiden up here on the mountain was fresh as the new-fallen snow, blooming as an alpine rose, and as nimble-footed as a young kid. Still, she was one of Adam's race, like Rudy. He flung his arms round the beautiful being, and gazed into her wonderfully clear eyes, only for a moment. But in that moment words cannot express the effect of his gaze. Was it the spirit of life, or of death that overpowered him? Was he rising higher, or sinking lower and lower into the deep, deadly abyss? He knew not, but the walls of ice shone like blue-green glass, innumerable clefts yawned around him, and the water-drops tinkled like the chiming of church bells, and shone clearly as pearls in the light of a pale blue flame. The ice maiden, for she it was, kissed him, and her kiss sent a chill as of ice through his whole frame. A cry of agony escaped from him. He struggled to get free, and tottered from her. For a moment all was dark before his eyes, but when he opened them again, it was light, and the alpine maiden had vanished. The powers of evil had played their game. The sheltering hut was no more to be seen. The water trickled down the naked sides of the rocks, and snow lay thickly all about. Rudy shivered with cold. He was wet through to the skin, and his ring was gone, the betrothal ring that Babette had given him. His gun lay near him in the snow. He took it up and tried to discharge it, but it missed fire. Heavy clouds lay on the mountain clefts like firm masses of snow. Upon one of these Vertigo sat, lurking after his powerless prey, and from beneath came a sound as if a piece of rock had fallen from the cleft and was crushing everything that stood in its way or opposed its course. But, at the miller's, Babette sat alone and wept. Rudy had not been to see her for six days. He who was in the wrong, and who ought to ask for her forgiveness, for did she not love him with her whole heart? 13. At the Mill What strange creatures human beings are, said the parlor cat to the kitchen cat. Babette and Rudy have fallen out with each other. She sits and cries, and he thinks no more about her. That does not please me to hear, said the kitchen cat. Nor me either, replied the parlor cat. But I do not take it to heart. Babette may fall in love with the red whiskers, if she likes, but he has not been here since he tried to get on the roof. The powers of evil carry their game both around us and within us. Rudy knew this, and thought a great deal about it. What was it that had happened to him on the mountain? Was it really a ghostly apparition or a fever dream? Rudy knew nothing of fever or any other ailment. But while he judged Babette, he began to examine his own conduct. He had allowed wild thoughts to chase each other in his heart, and a fierce tornado to break loose. Could he confess to Babette, indeed, every thought which in the hour of temptation might have led him to wrongdoing? He had lost her ring, and that very loss had won him back to her. Could she expect him to confess? He felt as if his heart would break while he thought of it, and while so many memories lingered on his mind. He saw her again, as she once stood before him, a laughing, spirited child, many loving words which she had spoken to him out of the fullness of her love came like a ray of sunshine into his heart, and soon it was all sunshine as he thought of Babette. But she must also confess she was wrong. That she should do. He went to the mill. He went to confession. It began with a kiss and ended with Rudy being considered the offender. It was such a great fault to doubt Babette's truth. It was most 
abominable of him. Such mistrust, such violence, would cause them both great unhappiness. This certainly was very true. She knew that, and therefore Babette preached him a little sermon, with which she was herself much amused, and during the preaching of which she looked quite lovely. She acknowledged, however, that on one point Rudy was right. Her godmother's nephew was a fop. She intended to burn the book which he had given her, so that not the slightest thing should remain to remind her of him. "'Well, that quarrel is over,' said the kitchen-cat. "'Rudy is come back, and they are friends again, which they say is the greatest of all pleasures.' "'I heard the rat say one night,' said the kitchen-cat, that the greatest pleasure in the world was to eat tallow candles and to feast on rancid bacon. Which are we to believe, the rats or the lovers? Neither of them, said the parlor cat. It is always the safest plan to believe nothing you hear. The greatest happiness was coming for Rudy and Babette. The happy day, as it is called, that is, their wedding day, was near at hand. They were not to be married at the church at Bex, nor at the miller's house. Babette's godmother wished the nuptials to be solemnized at Monto, in the pretty little church in that town. The miller was very anxious that this arrangement should be agreed to. He alone knew what the newly married couple would receive from Babette's godmother, and he knew also that it was a wedding present well worth a concession. The day was fixed, and they were to travel as far as Villeneuve the evening before, to be in time for the steamer which sailed in the morning for Monto, and the godmother's daughters were to dress and adorn the bride. Here in this house there ought to be a wedding day kept, said the parlor cat, or else I would not give a mew for the whole affair. There is going to be great feasting, replied the kitchen cat. Ducks and pigeons have been killed, and a whole roebuck hangs on the wall. It makes me lick my lips when I think of it. Tomorrow morning they will begin the journey. Yes, tomorrow, and this evening, for the last time, Rudy and Babette sat in the miller's house as an engaged couple. Outside, the Alps glowed in the evening sunset, the evening bells chimed and the children of the sunbeam saying, Whatever happens is best. 14. Night Visions The sun had gone down, and the clouds lay low on the valley of the Rhone. The wind blew from the south across the mountains. It was an African wind, a wind which scattered the clouds for a moment, and then suddenly fell, the broken clouds hung in fantastic forms upon the wood-covered hills by the rapid Rhone. They assumed the shapes of antediluvian animals, of eagles hovering in the air, of frogs leaping over a marsh, and then sunk down upon the rushing stream and appeared to sail upon it, although floating in the air. An uprooted fir tree was being carried away by the current, and marking out its path by eddying circles on the water. Vertigo and his sisters were dancing upon it, and raising these circles on the foaming river. The moon lighted up the snow on the mountain tops, shone on the dark woods, and on the drifting clouds those fantastic forms which at night might be taken for spirits of the powers of nature. The mountain-dweller saw them through the panes of his little window. They sailed in hosts before the ice-maiden as she came out of her palace of ice. Then she seated herself on the trunk of the fir-tree as on a broken skiff, and the water from the glaciers carried her down the river to the open lake. The wedding guests are coming, sounded from air and sea. These were the sights and sounds without. Within there were visions, 
for Babette had a wonderful dream. She dreamt that she had been married to Rudy for many years, and that one day, when he was out chamois hunting, and she alone in their dwelling at home, the young Englishman with the golden whiskers sat by her. His eyes were quite eloquent, and his words possessed a magic power. He offered her his hand, and she was obliged to follow him. They went out of the house and stepped downwards, always downwards, and it seemed to Babette as if she had a weight on her heart, which continually grew heavier. She felt she was committing a sin against Rudy, a sin against God. Suddenly she found herself forsaken, her clothes torn by the thorns, and her hair gray. She looked upwards in her agony, and there, on the edge of the rock, she espied Rudy. She stretched out her arms to him, but she did not venture to call him or to pray, and had she called him, it would have been useless, for it was not Rudy, only his hunting coat and hat hanging on an alpenstock, as the hunters sometimes arrange them, to deceive the chamois. Oh! she exclaimed in her agony, oh, that I had died on the happiest day of my life, my wedding day! Oh, my God, it would have been a mercy and a blessing had Rudy travelled far from me, and I had never known him. None know what will happen in the future. And then, in ungodly despair, she cast herself down into the deep rocky gulf. The spell was broken. A cry of terror escaped her, and she awoke. The dream was over. It had vanished. But she knew she had dreamt something frightful about the young Englishman. Yet months had passed since she had seen him or even thought of him. Was he still at Monto? And should she meet him there on her wedding day? A slight shadow passed over her pretty mouth as she thought of this, and she knit her brows. But the smile soon returned to her lip, and joy sparkled in her eyes. For this was the morning of the day on which she and Rudy were to be married, and the sun was shining brightly. Rudy was already in the parlor when she entered it, and they very soon started for Villeneuve. Both of them were overflowing with happiness, and the miller was in the best of tempers, laughing and merry. He was a good, honest soul, and a kind father. Now we are masters of the house, said the parlor cat. 15. The Conclusion It was early in the afternoon, and just at dinner time, when the three joyous travelers reached Villeneuve. After dinner, the miller placed himself in the armchair, smoked his pipe, and had a little nap. The bridal pair went arm in arm out through the town and along the high road at the foot of the wood-covered rocks and by the deep blue lake. The gray walls and the heavy, clumsy-looking towers of the gloomy castle of Chilon were reflected in the clear flood. The little island, on which grew the three Arcasias, lay at a short distance looking like a bouquet rising from the lake. "'How delightful it must be to live there!' said Babette, who again felt the greatest wish to visit the island, and an opportunity offered to gratify her wish at once, for on the shore lay a boat, and the rope by which it was moored could be very easily loosened. They saw no one near, so they took possession of it without asking permission of any one, and Rudy could row very well. The oars divided the pliant water like the fins of a fish, that water which, with all its yielding softness, is so strong to bear and to carry, so mild and smiling when at rest, and yet so terrible in its destroying power. A white streak of foam followed in the wake of the boat, which, in a few minutes,
carried them both to the little island where they went on shore, but there was only just room enough for two to dance. Rudy swung Babette round two or three times, and then, hand in hand, they sat down on a little bench under the drooping acacia tree and looked into each other's eyes, while everything around them glowed in the rays of the setting sun. The fir-tree forests on the mountains were covered with a purple hue like the heather bloom, and where the woods terminated and the rocks became prominent, they looked almost transparent in the rich, crimson glow of the evening sky. The surface of the lake was like a bed of pink rose leaves. As the evening advanced, the shadows fell upon the snow-capped mountains of Savoy, painting them in colors of deep blue, while their topmost peaks glowed like red lava, and for a moment this light was reflected on the cultivated parts of the mountains, making them appear as if newly risen from the lap of earth, and giving to the snow-crested peak of the Dent du Midi the appearance of the full moon as it rises above the horizon. Rudy and Babette felt that they had never seen the alpine glow in such perfection before. How very beautiful it is, and what happiness to be here! exclaimed Babette. Earth has nothing more to bestow upon me, said Rudy. An evening like this is worth a whole life. Often have I realized my good fortune, but never more than in this moment. I feel that if my existence were to end now, I should still have lived a happy life. What a glorious world this is! One day ends, and another begins even more beautiful than the last. How infinitely good God is, Babette! I have such complete happiness in my heart, said she. Earth has no more to bestow, answered Rudy, and then came the sound of the evening bells borne upon the breeze over the mountains of Switzerland and Savoy, while still in the golden splendor of the west stood the dark blue mountains of Jura. God grant you all that is brightest and best, exclaimed Babette. He will, said Rudy. He will to-morrow. Tomorrow you will be wholly mine, my own sweet wife. The boat! cried Babette suddenly. The boat in which they were to return had broken loose and was floating away from the island. I will fetch it back, said Rudy. Throwing off his coat and boots, he sprang into the lake and swam with strong efforts towards it. The dark blue water from the glaciers of the mountains was icy cold and very deep. Rudy gave but one glance into the water beneath, but in that one glance he saw a gold ring rolling, glittering, and sparkling before him. His engaged ring came into his mind, but this was larger, and spread into a glittering circle, in which appeared a clear glacier. Deep chasms yawned around it, the water-drops glittered as if lighted with blue flame, and tinkled like the chiming of church bells. In one moment he saw what would require many words to describe. Young hunters and young maidens, men and women who had sunk in the deep chasms of the glaciers, stood before him here in lifelike forms, with eyes open and smiles on their lips and far beneath them could be heard the chiming of the church bells of buried villages, where the villagers knelt beneath the vaulted arches of churches in which ice blocks formed the organ pipes and the mountain stream the music. On the clear transparent ground sat the ice maiden. She raised herself towards Rudy and kissed his feet and instantly a cold, deathly chill, like an electric shock, passed through his limbs. Ice or fire? It was impossible to tell. The shock was so instantaneous. 
mine, mine, sounded around him and within him. I kissed thee when thou wert a little child. I once kissed thee on the mouth, and now I have kissed thee from heel to toe. Thou art wholly mine. And then he disappeared in the clear blue water. All was still. The church bells were silent. The last tone floated away with the last red glimmer of the evening clouds. Thou art mine, sounded from the depths below, but from the heights above, from the eternal world, also sounded the words, Thou art mine. Happy was he thus to pass from life to life, from earth to heaven. A chord was loosened, and tones of sorrow burst forth. The icy kiss of death had overcome the perishable body. It was but the prelude before life's real drama could begin, the discord which was quickly lost in harmony. Do you think this is a sad story? Poor Babette, for her it was unspeakable anguish. The boat drifted farther and farther away. No one on the opposite shore knew that the betrothed pair had gone over to the little island. The clouds sunk as the evening drew on, and it became dark. Alone, in despair, she waited and trembled. The weather became fearful. Flash after flash lighted up the mountains of Jura, Savoy, and Switzerland, while peals of thunder that lasted for many minutes rolled over her head. The lightning was so vivid that every single vine stem could be seen for a moment as distinctly as in the sunlight at noonday, and then all was veiled in darkness. It flashed across the lake in winding zigzag lines, lighting it up on all sides, while the echoes of the thunder grew louder and stronger. On land, the boats were all carefully drawn up on the beach. Every living thing sought shelter, and at length the rain poured down in torrents. "'Where can Rudy and Babette be in this awful weather?' said the miller. Poor Babette sat with her hands clasped and her head bowed down, dumb with grief. She had ceased to weep and cry for help. "'In the deep water,' she said to herself, "'far down he lies, as if beneath a glacier.' Deep in her heart rested the memory of what Rudy had told her of the death of his mother and of his own recovery, even after he had been taken up as dead from the cleft in the glacier. Ah, she thought, the ice maiden has him at last. Suddenly there came a flash of lightning, as dazzling as the rays of the sun on the white snow. The lake rose for a moment like a shining glacier, and before Babette stood the pallid, glittering, majestic form of the Ice Maiden, and at her feet lay Rudy's corpse. Mine! she cried, and again all was darkness around the heaving water. How cruel! murmured Babette. Why should he die just as the day of happiness drew near? Merciful God, enlighten my understanding, shed light upon my heart, for I cannot comprehend the arrangements of thy providence, even while I bow to the decree of thy almighty wisdom and power. And God did enlighten her heart. A sudden flash of thought, like a ray of mercy, recalled her dream of the preceding night. All was vividly represented before her. She remembered the words and wishes she had expressed that what was best for her and for Rudy she might piously submit to. Woe is me, she said. Was the germ of sin really in my heart? Was my dream a glimpse into the course of my future life, whose thread must be violently broken to rescue me from sin? O oh, miserable creature that I am! Thus she sat lamenting in the dark night, while through the deep stillness the last words of Rudy seemed to ring in her ears. This earth has nothing more to bestow. Words uttered in the fullness of joy were again heard amid the depths of sorrow. Years have passed since this sad event happened. 
The shores of the peaceful lake still smile in beauty. The vines are full of luscious grapes. Steamboats, with waving flags, pass swiftly by. Pleasure boats, with their swelling sails, skim lightly over the watery mirror, like white butterflies. The railway is opened beyond Chulon, and goes far into the deep valley of the Rhone. At every station strangers alight with red-bound guide-books in their hands, in which they read of every place worth seeing. They visit Chulon, and observe on the lake the little island with the three Arcasias, and then read in their guide-book the story of the bridal pair who, in the year 1856, rode over to it. They read that the two were missing till the next morning, when some people on the shore heard the despairing cries of the bride, and went to her assistance, and by her were told of the bridegroom's fate. But the guide-book does not speak of Babette's quiet life afterwards with her father, not at the mill, strangers dwell there now, but in a pretty house in a row near the station. On many an evening she sits at her window and looks out over the chestnut trees to the snow-capped mountains on which Rudy once roamed. She looks at the alpine glow in the evening sky, which is caused by the children of the sun retiring to rest on the mountain tops. And again they breathe their song of the traveller whom the whirlwind could deprive of his cloak but not of his life. There is a rosy tint on the mountain snow, and there are rosy gleams in each heart in which dwells the thought. God permits nothing to happen which is not best for us. But this is not often revealed to all, as it was revealed to Babette in her wonderful dream. End of The Ice Maiden Recording by Muriel